Welcome to worship at Zion Presbyterian Church. You are most welcome to be here, whether you're here with us today in our beautiful sanctuary or whether you're joining us online. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it together. Our choir puts our hearts in the right place for worship with their beautiful anthem, Lord of Mercy, Lord of Grace. And our call to worship is responsive. God, be merciful to me because you are loving. Lord, let me speak so I may praise you. And we indeed sing about God's goodness with our opening hymn, Come, O Font of Every Blessing.
Thanks be to God. Please be seated. In our prayers of adoration and confession today include a song as well, and that is a song for all of us to sing, and it is one of the more ancient prayers of confession found in all of the scriptures, and therefore one of the more ancient that we have in our world today, and it is create in me a clean heart, and it is part of a prayer of David in Psalm 51, and it will be part of our prayer of adoration and confession today as well, and you'll, you'll know it's time to sing when I say as part of the prayer, and we pray as we sing together, and then Faye will start to play, and as you do sing this, uh, sing it with a heart of prayer. So, let us pray. Eternal God, the refuge and help of all your children, we praise you for all that you've given us, all that you've done for us, all that you are to us. In our weakness, you are strength. In our darkness, you are light. In our sorrow, you are comfort and peace. We cannot number your blessings. We cannot fully explain your love. But for all your goodness, we praise you. May we live in your presence, love the things that you love, and serve you in our daily lives through Christ our Lord. Be with us in this place, in this time. Help us to find not only what we seek, but what we need wherever we may be. We need, Lord, a strong awareness of your presence and your spirit and your love. We need that awareness, Father, for we know that we live much of our lives just unconscious of your presence within. And so, thinking ourselves alone, thinking our actions of no consequence, we sin. In doing so, we fail not only you, but those we love and those in need, and even ourselves. And so we pray that you would create in us clean hearts, O God, that you would renew a right spirit within us. Help us be ever aware of your presence, conscious of your Holy Spirit living in and through us. Restore within us the joy of being your people, your children, the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers, Lord, as we sing together.
Hear the good news. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not continually accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love is toward those who fear him is as great as the height as the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Thanks be to God. Amen. And those words from Psalm 103 are as true then as they are now. We are at peace with God. We are at peace with one another. Now we have a children's story, and I know you're disappointed. We don't have a video, a Lego video today, but the Old Testament reading is the David and Bathsheba story. So you might be glad that we don't have a Lego video. That would have been tricky at best. But, uh, but Ada is here, and children are watching us uh, online. Instant little baby Ada was, was clapping her hands throughout that first hymn. I think Grandpa was helping, and Grandpa was also rubbing her tummy, and she was clapping her, her hands. And so maybe that's the Baptist secret. Maybe we have to get some tummy rubbing happening here in the service as well. My dog, Herschel used to be always happy to see me when I would come home. I would walk through the door, and Herschel would be overjoyed. He'd be wagging his tail and happy and wiggling, and he'd know that we were about to go for a walk and have a great time. He was always happy to see me. But every once in a while, when I would come home, I'd open the door, and he wouldn't come to the door. And I knew right away that he had done something wrong. And I would call him, Herschel, what have you done? And he would come slinking low to the ground with his tail between his legs and a kind of look of abject sorrow on his face that only a beagle can, uh, can really make. And I would say, what have you done? And he would be like this. And then I would have to discover what he had done. And maybe he had made a mess or maybe he had gotten into the cat food or any number of things. And then I would say to him, did you do this? And he would, and I'd say, are you sorry? And he would sort of nod, I think he'd nod. He sort of nodded. <laughs> to me, he nodded. And I said, don't you do that again. And then he would still be looking up. And then I would say, okay. And when I would say, okay, he'd bounce up and he'd be happy. And he'd be like, nothing happened. And we'd go for a walk and he would be fine. But the one lesson that always taught me was he knew when he had done something wrong. Now, the dog I have now, Ritter, he's still too young to know when he's done something wrong. He's kind of proud of when he does something wrong. So he's got some things to learn still. But Herschel was an old guy, and he knew when he had done something wrong. And he knew that he had to say sorry. And that before he was sorry, we couldn't be just like things always were and go for a walk and have that happy time. Now that's a beagle. Beagles are wonderful, beautiful, loving creatures, but they're not often listed as the smartest of all animals. But in some ways, that beagle is smarter than us. He always knew when to say sorry, and we often don't. We often keep hiding, and we often keep ourselves from restoring those relationships in our lives or saying sorry to the people that we've hurt. I think all of us, whether we're children or whether we're adults, can learn a good lesson from Herschel the Beagle, that it's important to be sorry and to say we're sorry so that we can restore the relationships we have with other people and life can be wonderful again. And so, let's say a prayer together as part of our children's story, and Ada can join in as well. Let's pray. You can say the words after me. Dear God, Help us to be sorry when we should be. Help us to say sorry to the people we should be sorry to. Help us always to make sure that we're okay with each other. Amen.
The sanctuary choir sings for us grace alone. Amen. Thank you, choir. And so with those words and that music in our hearts, we turn to God with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. These are followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, not because we deserve to be, but because of your grace, we are your people. From our hearts, we thank you for your goodness and kindness to us and to all. We thank and praise you for creation and health and the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in saving this world through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity of forgiveness, the challenge to forgive, and the hope of heaven. 
We pray that you would give us a full sense of your mercy so that we would be truly thankful, so that we would praise you not only with our voices but with our lives, serving you, living as you would have us live in love, in truth, in peace, and in forgiveness. Keep us faithful, we pray. Deliver us from distraction. Lead us to your love. Almighty God, you've given us grace to pray together. You've promised that when we gather together in your name, wherever we may be, you will hear our prayers. And so, Lord, answer our prayers according to what you know is best for us and for others. And so we pray And we pray for the lonely and the depressed and the oppressed. We pray for the worried and the distraught and the sick. We pray for the people of our world living in the shadow of COVID and the many who are living in its grip. We pray for people around the world suffering the calamity of pandemic. Places like India are almost impossible for us to imagine what it must be like. And there are places in our own country so very, very much worse off than we. May your help, mercy, love, comfort, healing, and joy be with them all. And lead us to people who are in need that we may bring comfort and hope and tangible response. Help us to be your instruments of answered prayer, O Lord. We pray for the sick in our congregation, our community, our world. We pray for families near and far. We pray for those desperate for medical help, as well as those who are giving and receiving treatment, often at great cost to themselves. Hear us as we pray for those who grieve. We think especially today of of Shirley Vino as she has experienced the loss of her sister Doris Waite. And answer also the prayers which we bring before you now in the silence of our hearts. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, not because we deserve to be, but because of your grace, we are your servants. So help us to live among one another and our world to serve you in ways that make a difference. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Oh, amazing grace. Oh, amazing. How can it be 
that I this love might gain. It saved a helpless one like me, the one who caused your pain. Oh, amazing love. Oh, amazing. Oh, amazing love. To me, shall we sing the song forever? For this theme will never fade in the flow of life. Eternal Jesus, how amazing are your ways. Oh, amazing God, the Father's love unfolded through the Son and risen by the spirit's breath the godhead three in one oh amazing god oh amazing oh amazing god to me oh amazing god oh amazing oh amazing god to me And with those words in our hearts, our Old Testament reading of from Psalm 51, we've revisited it throughout the service today, and we will continue to do so, and we do so now responsively. Perhaps stand as we do this responsive reading, since you won't have an opportunity to do so again prior to the sermon. God, be merciful to me because you are loving. Because you are always ready to be merciful. Wash away all my guilt and make me clean again. I know what I promise, and I can't forget my sin. You're the only one I've sinned against. I have done what you say is wrong. You are right to be seated, I was brought into this world in sin. In sin, my mother gave birth to me. You are Take away my sin, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me your sons of joy and gladness, that I may be happy again. Turn your face from my sins, and wipe out all my guilt. Create in me a pure heart, and make my spirit right Do not send me away from you, or take your Holy Spirit away from me. Give me back. Then I will teach your ways to those who do wrong, and sinners will turn back to you. God, save me from the guilt of sin. God, my salvation, and I will sing about your goodness. Lord, let me speak so I may praise you. You are not pleased by sacrifices, or I would give them. You know what? The sacrifice God wants is a broken spirit. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
Our New Testament reading is from the first letter of John, not the Gospel of John, but the first letter of John, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. And in this letter, John writes the following. If we claim that we're free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, make a clean break of them, he won't let us down. God will be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins. He'll purge us of all wrongdoing. Because if we claim that we've never sinned, we out and out contradict God. Make a liar out of him. A claim like that only shows off our ignorance of God. May God bless to us the reading of his word. Last week we heard an astonishing story of forgiveness about how the Apostle Paul and the deacon Philip were, were reconciled. Philip even inviting Paul to stay with him and, and with his family, despite Paul's supervision and approval of the murder of Philip's friend Stephen in those years before Paul had met Jesus. We learned through that story that forgiveness changes lives. It certainly changed Paul, and it can change us as well. And it seemed to me after last Sunday that we had only just kind of scraped the surface of, of forgiveness. So central is forgiveness to our lives as Christians, the forgiveness that we receive from God and the forgiveness that we extend to others. I feel the need to go back to the scriptures for another look at forgiveness. This time, however, the focus will be on another facet of forgiveness, the condition of the heart that is necessary to receive it. What do I mean by that? Well, when my beautiful son Jacob was just a little guy, he often found himself in a situation where he was required to say sorry. Often. And most often to his sister Hannah. And this scene was replayed so frequently I can hear it like it was yesterday. Tell your sister you're sorry. Fine! Sorry! Not like that. Say it like you mean it. Sorry! Well, not surprisingly, this resulted in someone being sent to their room until they were ready to say it and to mean it. That is to say, forgiveness was offered, but it required the condition of the heart necessary to receive it. Or, in other words, forgiveness is both offered and available to us, but we do have to be ready to receive forgiveness. And there's no better example of that than King David. Now, we just read a prayer of David's. We've read it, we've sung it, we've prayed it. Psalm 51, a heart-rending prayer of confession and forgiveness and restoration. You might wonder out of what context the prayer comes. Well, here's the background to the story. The background's name is Bathsheba, and you might remember her as the one who took a long bath outside on her roof in the gentle breeze of a warm Jerusalem night, the light of the moon playing upon her as she fell under the amorous gaze of the king. Now David, after a long hot day kinging, or whatever it is kings do, had gone up to the palace penthouse and, and a stroll through the roof garden when looking down over the city, he caught sight of her bathing on her rooftop, her oiled skin glistening in the moonlight like a peeled pear. He had to have her, and have her he did, and when the possibility of a jealous husband arose, he arranged to have the fellow killed, for after all, who's king here anyway? 
And the days and the weeks and the months pass, and we assume that the king's conscience is rendered mute by the timpani of lust which rushes to his head whenever he sees or smells or even thinks of Bathsheba in the bath or the bed. His conscience undisturbed, David happily welcomes his religious advisor, Nathan the prophet, into the throne room. Nathan has a story to tell. The king lends an ear. There were two men in a certain town, says Nathan, one rich, the other poor. The rich man, the rich man owned a lot of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had only one, one little lamb that he had bought and raised. The lamb became like a, like a pet for him and his children. He even let it eat from his plate and drink from his cup and and sleep on his lap. The lamb was like one of his own children. One day, someone came to visit the rich man, but the rich man didn't want to kill any of his own multitude of sheep or cattle and serve it to the visitor, so he stole the poor man's little lamb and killed and served it instead. Well, David was furious with the rich man and said to Nathan, I swear by the living Lord that the man who did this deserves to die. Because he didn't have any pity on the poor man, he will have to pay four times what the lamb was worth. And then Nathan told David, you, you are that rich man. David gets the point. He had everything. Power, palaces, wives. Uriah had one thing. Bathsheba. And not only did David steal her, he set Uriah to his death to cover his tracks. Oh boy, he has fallen, has David not only has he fallen, but worse yet, he got caught, which is generally what we're afraid of. Falling into sin is kind of like jumping off a cliff. For a while, everything's just a rush. Getting caught is like what happens when, like wild E. Coyote, poof, you hit bottom. He's fallen, he got caught, He's hit bottom. Now what? Which brings us to the moment of truth. At this moment, David has several options before him, several ways in which he can deal with his sin. Number one, of course, is he can deny it. Who? Ba bath who? Never heard of her. Never laid eyes or anything else on her. Never stood on the balcony of my palace as she bathed in the all together and the out of doors. Never had her hubby bumped off. Never ever did I take a poor man's sheep. I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> That's a very old political joke. Being a politician, you see, denial is what comes naturally to David. And to be fair, denial is most often our first instinct as well. But King David, confronted by Nathan, doesn't. Denial, option number one, is off the table. Option number two is he can make light of it. He can laugh it off. Everybody's, everybody's doing it, Nathan. David might say, get with the program. Nathan, Nathan, don't you watch any TV? It may be the way of the world. It, it is the way of the world. It, it, maybe you should get out a little bit more. Put a smile on your face, Nathan. You've you got one life to live. Don't let it pass you by. You're not getting any younger, Nathan, etc., etc. We try similar excuses all the time, but in this case, again, David, he doesn't. Minimizing the seriousness of our sin, option number two, it's off the table. Now, he could try to ignore it, 
brush it aside. Well, it's too late now, Nathan, he might say. No use crying over spilt milk. What's past is past. Deed is done. Your eye is dead. Bathsheba's in my bed. It happened. That's all. Better just get on with life. It's up to you, Nathan, to accept it. Ignore it. Move on. It'll simply go away. Except it doesn't. It doesn't go away. So David wisely didn't do that either. It's harder, I suppose, with murder on your hands, especially when you've been caught. So what's he going to do? He's fallen, but will he get back up? Or, or will he let this eat away at him until he joins Uriah in the ground? What's his answer? Well, his answer is to confess it. And Psalm 51 is the prayer David prays when blood draining from his face, jaw falling to the floor, eyes filling with tears, he realizes the enormity of what he has done. Forgive me, please, he prays to God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new and a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He's faced up to it. He admits his sin. He admits his responsibility. He repents. And he prays. He, he prays the prayer that we've prayed today, sung today, said today, still powerful, still moving 3,000 years later. And David prayed that prayer because the condition of his heart was ready finally to both seek and to receive forgiveness. And we pray that prayer because we too have fallen, are fallen, continue to fall, continue to sin, maybe not as dramatically as David, but still. Big cliff or little cliff, we all jump at some time or other, and no matter how high or how low, it hurts to hit bottom. It damages us in ways big or small. And it damages others too. We are sinners. And it isn't just me with such a low opinion of us. Listen to the Apostle John. We heard him earlier making his case saying, you know, if, if we claim that we are free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we, admit, if we admit our sins, if we make a clean break of them, He won't let us down. God will be true to Himself. He will forgive our sins and purge us of all wrongdoing. Friends, if we claim that we've never sinned, we out and out contradict God. We make a liar out of Him claim like that only shows off our ignorance of God. Boy, there's old John removing our options in one fell swoop. No denying, no minimizing, no shrugging it off. We, like David, are far from perfect. We, like David, need to confess because we know that we need to start fresh. We need to clear the air. We need to tear down the walls which separate us from God and from one another. We need to confess. We need to be forgiven. And to do that, to receive forgiveness, our hearts need to be in the condition necessary to receive forgiveness. Now, earlier in the sermon, we left Jacob up in his room until he was ready to say sorry and mean it. Sometimes it would take a little while, other times it would take a long while. But inevitably, he'd come down the stairs, his cheeks wet with tears, and he'd say, I am sorry now. And he'd hug his mother, and he'd hug his sister, and his tears would be dried. 
because his heart had finally been in the condition necessary to receive forgiveness. And that condition used to be called remorse, which is a word not often heard in our world anymore. It means to be genuinely sorrowful and regretful for, for what you've done. And it is the necessary first step in seeking the forgiveness that God so freely offers. And seeking forgiveness from God is the first step towards seeking forgiveness from others. Getting right with God is the first step toward getting right with ourselves and with others. That's why we start each service with prayers of confession. Because sin, sin, and we need to pray. See, one of the misconceptions in our world is that to be a Christian, you need to be perfect, or that Christians think they are perfect. But being a Christian doesn't mean you're perfect. Coming to church does not mean that you are without sin, but it does mean that you're engaged in the process of forgiveness, seeking forgiveness from God, forgiving others, and seeking to restore the relationships that our decisions and actions or lack of actions have damaged. It's a process that we're going through week by week. Here's another way of looking at it. The Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were a very strict sect of Judaism. Talking about all this sin gives me dry mouth. Pharisees were a very strict sect of Judaism dedicating their lives to living in extremely careful obedience to the hundreds of commandments in their religious law. And they stayed well away from people who were not as fastidious. They particularly looked down their noses at those who made a living in cooperating with the pagan Roman government. So when Jesus called Matthew, who was also known as Levi, to be one of his disciples, the Pharisees were outraged. Listen to this story. We hear, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in his tax collecting booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So, Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi, in celebration, held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor, and many, many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complained bitterly to Jesus, why do you eat and drink with such scum? And Jesus answered them, and he said, you know, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they're perfect, but those who know they are sinners and need to change their ways and turn to God. Jesus, you see, didn't come for the perfect. He couldn't. They were convinced they had no need of him. Their hearts were closed to forgiveness. For they believed that all they did was correct and right. It's where the phrase self-righteous comes from, which is why Jesus said that he came for the imperfect, for those who, who know that they need help, for those who know they need to change. In short, Jesus came for those whose hearts were in the necessary condition to receive forgiveness. Jesus came for us. He came for the murderer David. He came for the adulterous Bathsheba. He came for shifty Matthew and his shifty friends. He came for me and he came for you. Why? <laughs> Why? Why indeed? Well, because for reasons beyond our understanding, God loves us. God loves the world. God wants nothing more than the wounded relationships between us and God, between one, us and one another, between us and, and creation itself to be healed, to be restored, to be made new. And when those relationships are made new, then we become new as well for the very nature of our lives changes. 
Suddenly, we live for life and not for death. We live for peace and not in egotistical isolation. We live as we were created to live and as we shall live forevermore. We live as the children of God, imperfect but forgiven and forgiving. Now, we're not perfect yet. God knows we're far from perfect. I'm not perfect yet. I was hoping somebody would object. I was hoping one person would say, no, no, you are, but no. None of us are perfect. But as David teaches us, to pray for forgiveness is to begin the journey of becoming the people Jesus would have us be, imperfect but forgiven and forgiving. And so we pray. Let's pray again. God, be merciful to me because you are loving. Wash away all my guilt and make me clean again. Take away my sin and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Turn your face from my sins and wipe out all my guilt. Do not send me away or take your Holy Spirit away from me. The sacrifice God wants is a broken spirit. A heart that is ready to be forgiven. Thanks be to God for the healing of forgiveness. May it permeate our lives, our relationship, our world. May it be our prayer. May it be our beginning. May it be our end. May our hearts be in the necessary condition to receive forgiveness. May it be our response to the astonishing love and forgiveness of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. We sang earlier of the amazing grace of God, and now we sing together, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound.
To pray for forgiveness is to begin the journey of becoming the people that Jesus would have us be. Imperfect, yes, but forgiven and forgiving. And when we pray, the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with us now and forevermore. Amen.